And so you've mentioned the Legion of Mary and Frank Duff, and I'd like to just go a little bit further into those. And I don't know whether to start with the Legion of Mary or Frank Duff. I suppose maybe we'll start with Frank Duff, considering he started the Legion of Mary. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, you might tell us a little bit about Frank Duff, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, he was born in Dublin and um, he he went to Blackrock College. It's outside of the city and uh, very, very bright. But he was the oldest in his family and his father died when he was quite young. So although he was exceptionally gifted and talented in school, he um, he went out to work and support his mother and younger brothers and sisters. Um, and he um, he got very involved with the St. Vincent de Paul as a young man. And what really, I suppose, the turning point in, in, in his in his um, in his spiritual life was he came across the, the writings of St. Louis Mary de Montfort, who I mentioned earlier, and the, the idea of consecrating yourself to our Blessed Lady. And the interesting thing is that when Frank Duff first read it, he didn't connect with it. He thought it was a little bit difficult and a little, a little bit uh, overly pious and just didn't really resonate with him. And, um, and, he, and he left it aside. And then he had a, a good friend who encouraged him to read it again, read it again. And uh, I think it was the third, maybe fourth time he read it, um, it clicked. And he just got the idea of devotion to Our Lady and uh, what a, an impact it, it, it had and how it had to be taken seriously. And um, as I said, he'd been very active in the St. Vincent de Paul Society at this stage as a young man. And he, um, but he, he could see that, that there was a need for helping people in, in their spiritual lives. That while he was going out with the St. Vincent de Paul and helping, you know, there was a huge amount of poverty in, in Dublin at the time. Um, and he was going out helping people with, with uh, material needs, you know. Uh, but yet he could see that there was also spiritual poverty as well. Um, I mean, I think sometimes perhaps we look back and, and think that in old Irish Catholic Ireland, everyone was strong in the faith and, and very, very devout. Um, but he could see that there was a, a huge hunger there uh, for, 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 for God and, uh, and the role that our Blessed Lady would, would play in that. So basically, he called together a group of people to, um, to discuss how they would put St. Louis Mary de Montfort's true devotion into practice. And that effectively became the first Legion of Mary Presidium, the first group of the Legion of Mary, uh, that it, it had started by this idea of bringing people together to put devotion to, devotion to Mary into action. And uh, what year was this? In? 1921. So 100 years ago this year. Wow. Yeah. And so Ireland at that time, obviously, was going through a bit of turmoil. Well, I suppose we have to, yeah, to put it into historical context, I mean, you know, the, it was just after, you know, the Civil War, Irish independence, and, you know, it was a very turbulent time in Irish history. Um, and, uh, you know, the British just left and, and Ireland as a, a, the Republic as a newly founded state was, was still finding its feet. And uh, there was a huge amount of poverty still in the city. And when Frank Duff founded the Legion of Mary, at, at that time, the St. Vincent de Paul Society was only open to men. It's kind of hard to believe now, looking back. But in those days, only, only men were involved in St. Vincent de Paul. And because Frank Duff was so involved with the St. Vincent de Paul, he didn't want to be seen to be setting up a, a kind of a rival organization to, the, to, to St. Vincent de Paul. So he, he, he invited women to join the Legion of Mary. Um, so the first Presidium, that's the, the name that was, would later be given to a, a unit or a group of the, the Legion, they, they call it a Presidium. That's uh, the Latin term for something. Yeah, well, he, he based the whole Legion on, on the, the idea of the, of the Roman army, um, the Roman Legion. So oh, okay, he incorporated yeah. a lot of the terminology that, that the Roman army had used, and, and he saw it as, as our, our legions, uh, our ladies' legion, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, the the vexillum that the the Roman Roman Romans would have, you, you know, with the the eagle on top and and so forth, the the, the whole symbolism. Uh, Frank Duff used all that, but but uh, uh, put a Catholic spin on it. So instead of an eagle, it was a dove, you know, you know, for the Holy Spirit, and and coming down upon Our Lady and uh, bestowing graces upon the world. So so the whole idea was modeled on the idea of a of a an army for our Blessed Lady. Um, an army that would go out and fight not against the enemy but for the enemy so an army to go out and fight for the salvation of souls 
Yeah, yeah. So he founded the, the, the Legion and invited uh, women to come along. And as I said, it was he didn't intentionally set out to, to found the Legion of Mary. It, it all uh, it all came together over time. But but it, it initially began by calling together these women who met in the St. Vincent de Paul house up on Francis Street in, in Dublin here. Um, the St. Vincent de Paul allowed him use of the house uh, to hold this meeting. And um, he invited in the women and they they began going out um, spreading devotion to Our Lady. Um, the first work they did was in one of the hospitals in Dublin at the time, and they would go around and visit people and and uh, and basically share share the gift of faith with them. Um, Frank Duff had this great understanding that that in giving your faith, you receive more, you know, that uh, um, that it's kind of a principle in in the in the in the spiritual life. We say, for example, the work that that Frank Dove had been doing with the Saint Vincent de Paul, and very important work. And I don't mean to undermine this work at all, but but the idea of material relief when you go out and give material relief to another person, uh, it's it's a great act of charity. But if you give food or clothing to another person, uh, those goods are divided up, and it's very, and uh, and eventually they disappear. You know, so they're they're divided out and, and gone. But in the spiritual order, it, it's, 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 it's the opposite. Uh, spiritual gifts are not divided, but they're multiplied. And they don't disappear, but they're, they're eternal. They're everlasting. Um, so, so when you go out and share the gift of the faith with another person, uh, you're giving them a spiritual gift. And we have no idea how that will multiply or the effects that will have, how that might have knock-on effects, maybe generations later. You know, the simple act of, of sharing the gift of faith with another person, giving them a, a miraculous medal, giving them a prayer card, um, that might have echoing effects down to eternity that we'll never know, that we may never see. Um, so this was, you know, Frank Duff's, uh, he, he founded the, the, the Legion Spirituality upon this principle that in giving the faith, and, and we receive, you know, and he lays this out in, in the Legion handbook, which again would come later on as the Legion developed, he, he developed a whole system and, and a handbook. And he outlines that the first object of the first, uh, the first goal of the, the Legion of Mary is not the sanctification of other people, but the sanctification of the members. That, that you you grow in holiness by this sacrifice of putting yourself out there. And it's not easy to go out there and, and share the gift of faith with another person, but by making that sacrifice, um, you grow in, 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 in your own spirituality, your own faith. It increases by this act of love and, and this outpouring of grace and doing that in union with our Blessed Lady, that Our Lady works powerfully through our humble efforts to bring souls to Christ. Um, that this is our, our lady has this yearning, this longing uh, to bring her son to other people, and and she wants to use us to to do to make these efforts. Um, so it, you know it's very very profound, and and um, um, and, and Frank Duff deliberately set up a rule that the Legion of Mary would never get involved in giving material relief, because he could see that that would be that would come in conflict with the spiritual life. So if you're going out and you're meeting people, uh, even if they are in in our need of, of food or clothing or whatever um that we don't fall into the temptation of of going down that road we're there to give them spiritual help and to pray with them and to give them the gift of faith and and through that to try and help them uh in whatever difficulties they're in so um so so there's a huge temptation to, to go down the the, the kind of the, the social justice route if you want to put it that way but yeah. but frank duff was always maintaining that the work of the legion of mary was a spiritual work and therefore we don't get involved in material relief and we don't get involved in politics you know um even 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 uh, important issues like pro-life work and all of these things that are so important for catholics to be active and involved in as as members of the legion of mary we 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 don't include that as part of our legion work because our role is to go out there and bring our lady to people uh, speak about our faith and then through that all the other issues will, will come together so That's that's lovely. And that's not to say that someone can't do something privately or they oh, yeah. can't do Yeah, that. no, by all means, yeah, by all means, you know, as Catholics, you can get involved in all kinds of other groups, but just as part of our legion work, um, you know, we we just get to the core of our faith and, and devotion to our lady. That that's what it's all about. And all the other things, important though they may be, uh, they can be divisive and sometimes they can close more doors than they open, you know. So uh so really our lady is the key in spreading devotion to our lady. That, that's what it's about. Um I I think that, you know, some might be listening to this and thinking about, um, they might be thinking, 
oh, well, why couldn't you do both? Or, you know, why couldn't you do spiritual and material or whatever? But um, when we mention books again, um, Maura, my wife, her book club, they read a book last month, um, Give by Magnus McFarlane Barrow. It's a book on charity and, and giving. And he set up uh, Mary's Meals. Mm. And again, um, so they're providing meals to starving children. But again, like that, he, he wrote about, um, I suppose, in, in the mission statement of, of their charity, uh, that they, they must focus on just doing what what they're doing because any charity that or any organization that tries to take on too much yeah you know you're just you're biting off more than you can chew and you can't you can't do any more and he said that like they've had to resist the temptation of building schools and you know all these different things that they just have to go to schools that are in existence and feed children in those schools Mm -hmm. but again so when i think there of what you're saying about frank duff it's not a kind of um it's not that he's anti helping people out. No, no, yeah. So it's yeah. purely that the Legion cannot do everything. But he saw it in the, and, and St. Vincent de Paul were helping out materially, but he, yeah. he wants to get to the, the spiritual core. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I suppose that's kind of a way of looking at the negative side that there was the limitations of what could be done. But I think Frank Duff, in his wisdom, was looking at it from the positive side, that he believed that uh, that going out sharing the gift of faith was something so powerful that all the other problems in a person's life could be resolved if they came back into a proper understanding with Our, our Lady and, and Jesus. It's not to say that all the problems would disappear, um, but I think, you know, Frank Duff had this vision that if you go out and focus primarily on the spiritual, all the temporal problems will will uh, will fall in under that. You know, I won't say they'll be solved immediately, but 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 getting to the the spiritual problem is 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 really the the heart of the the Legion Apostolate, and and he could see that um, that even though there was huge poverty in Dublin at the time. Um, there was also a huge spiritual poverty, and 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 really, I mean that that's the crisis of today. You know, it, it's it's a spiritual crisis, and and everyone, no matter if you're rich or poor, or no matter what circumstances you're in, uh, we all need a, more encouragement in our in our spiritual lives. You know, we all need a bit of a a bit of a, a push, and and uh, and I think that's the work of the Legion of Mary is to meet people and to talk to them, and um, and to try and draw them into a deeper level with our Blessed Lady and Jesus. So if they're a million miles away from the church, you take gentle steps to kind of encourage them back if they're already in a in a deep relationship with our lord well then you know you maybe try and take them a a step further or get them a little bit more active in their faith or or whatever it is but just to meet people where they're at and 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 try and and encourage them to go further and uh, into the into their faith that's that's lovely because as you say they're about um by by handing on the gift of faith um that it's not that the other problems will go away, but the faith is the answer to the other problems. And and I just think that like, it's, I think his theology was brilliant. I think, um, I think that there's, a, that's a beautiful kind of um, spirituality because the other kind of temptation that, you know, you see it a lot, um, particularly with televangelists and things like that, you see this prosperity gospel. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, if you come to Jesus, you will be blessed with all these different riches and you have, you have all these things. But that's, you know, that's not what Frank Duff was saying. Frank Duff is, um, you know, he was just saying that it's more that without the material things, um, it's not giving material things that is going to change everything and help you. It's, um, you don't need material things spiritually. Um yeah you can actually start to have a different understanding, a different see things from a different perspective. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a beautiful acting out of the gospel, I think. Yeah. And, and, but it is tough and challenging because I think we like to see the results from what we do and we like to do some active work and, and to look back and get a sense of satisfaction that something has been achieved, you know, and, um, 
with, with the Legion of Mary work, you, you don't always get that, you know. Um, you might be out visiting homes in a parish. You might be standing out in the street, you know, with prayer cards and miraculous medals and, and trying to talk to people and connect with them. Um, and and sometimes you you just get rejected and rejected and and uh, and it can be tough because you don't see the effects and yet you just go out there in faith knowing that what you're doing is important that it's the most important thing that can be done going out there trying to bring Christ to other people and and yes you're making yourself vulnerable you're putting yourself at risk you, you don't know what people are going to say people might get annoyed or people might get angry with you um, and, and in reality, that happens so very little, you know, um, for the most part, people, when you meet people on a one to one basis and try and talk to them about God and about faith, um, generally people, um, you know, they, they don't get angry. Sometimes they might, but for the most part, there's a hunger out there and, and people are only too glad for somebody to to make that step and, and try and befriend them. And, and that's at the heart of the Legion of Mary spirituality as well is the idea of person to person contact that you go out and you, you get to know people, you spend time with them, you listen to them. You're not out there, you know, um, pushing your faith onto them, trying to twist their arm into something, but you're, you're listening to them, seeing their difficulties, uh, trying to understand where they are, how can you bring God into their, into their lives and in a gentle, humble way um, to be there as instruments of Our Lady to bring Christ into, 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 into people's lives. And, it and sounds a lot like the the principles that uh, spiritually it sounds like the principles that mother Teresa was working from yeah 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 i mean yeah and, and again she practiced saint louis Mary de montfort's true devotion so yeah it's, it's built upon the same spiritual foundation if you want to put it that way um but yeah i mean it, it's tough because you know it's it's um you're not going to get a pat on the back for doing it you know or you may not never see results from it uh, sometimes you know people might you might have a really really uh, life changing conversation with somebody and it might you might see them come back to the practice of their faith or whatever but uh, but those moments are are usually rare sometimes it's just these little little gentle uh, encouragement that you're giving people hoping that it'll it'll have some kind of knock on effect. Yeah, well, I suppose you know it's kind of. One of the things, um, one of the things I'm I'm guilty of here, we'll say with just in the garden, is um, Mara would often say to me, um, oh, will we put out, oh, say it could be oh, September, October, November, whenever Mara would say, will we put out daffodil bulbs, you know, and, uh, you know, she oh, we'll, we'll put them out alongside the driveway and things like that, and it'll be beautiful in March, April, you know, the, the daffodils will be coming up, and, and I'd just be like, no, <laughs> I've no interest in doing that. I'd be like, I wouldn't say no. I'd say, oh yeah, yeah. But I just, I just don't do it because I don't see the instant results. So what I'll do is in March or April, I'll go to the garden center and I'll buy something that's like flowering now, right? And then it's like, I want to put that down so I can see great results. But the thing is, you know, six, eight weeks later, that's stopped flowering and I'm kind of, I'm disgusted with myself. Meanwhile, Maura has, you know, she's seen kind of um, maybe over time through patience and things like that, that the fruits of the bulbs that she went out and put down, you know, as they grow, there's, you know, she sees the little shoots maybe in January starting to come up and then then she's got the flowers and yeah, they'll go away. But over time, you know, things have happened and she hasn't had to stand there and look for the results. And I suppose like that, okay you know i suppose every analogy breaks down in some way but with these things i suppose it's it's like not putting down bulbs in our own garden but it's like putting them down in other people's gardens that we won't be coming back to yeah, yeah. but over time and prayer yeah. some of these will take off and, and we we won't see it yeah yeah and i think that's why the legion of mary is such a, a good formation for lay people you know that are just out there uh, ordinary people working ordinary jobs and yet when they get involved in the legion of mary there, there's a discipline to it and um, because it requires a weekly meeting and then two hours work you know evangelization two hours apostolic work uh, that's part of, of the, the the group that you're with and um and, and that requires a certain discipline um temperance again you know that we have to kind of moderate what we do and and all of that 
Um, but it, it trains us, it forms us um, by attending the, the, the meetings and being formed in the, the spirituality of, of, you know, Frank Duff's wisdom founded on the Legion of Mary by, by soaking all this in and by learning by the other members as well and working with them and, and, uh, and you know, sharing from their experiences um, that it, it's a gradual thing and it requires patience. And, you know, many people come to the Legion of Mary and find that it's, it's very strict, very, you know, regimental um, and they find it too tough. But I think if, if you persevere with it and uh, allow yourself to settle into the into the into the um, the spirituality of it, which takes a little bit of time, uh, it, it forms you and it forms your spiritual life um, and uh, in, in, in the bigger picture. But you're not going to get immediate satisfaction or immediate results, but you have to be patient. And when I first joined the Legion of Mary, I, I found it a little bit, um, you know, I was wondering, am I really ready for this? Is it too much for me? Or is it, uh, is it, is, is, you know, I, there was a temptation that maybe, I, you know, it, it wasn't for me. Um, Were you a priest at the time? No, no, no. I was only in my early 20s and I moved to Dublin and, uh, and I was, you know, somewhat lukewarm in my Catholic faith. I, I didn't really get it. I mean, I was open to Catholicism, but I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, by any means, um, uh, what would you say? I, I, I was sort of on the fence, shall we say. Yeah. And when I joined the Legion of Mary, I thought, okay, this, this is very, very deep stuff. I mean, they were praying the rosary. Every meeting begins with the rosary. Um, I hadn't prayed the rosary before. I, I heard it said at my granny's funeral when I was eight or nine or something, but, but, uh, but it was all very new to me. And uh, as I said, I had this temptation that, that it was just too much and I wasn't holy enough. I wasn't pious enough. Um, and yet I could see this goodness in, in the people that were there. Um, this joy that was there, this, this, um, this sense of fulfillment. And these people who had been in the Legion of Mary, some of them for, for years, you know, and, and, uh, and they had this, this uh, that they were formed in this Marian spirituality. That was something that on one level, it made me feel a little, little awkward and uncomfortable and, and embarrassed to be there. And, and yet on a deeper level, there was just a sense of peace and at home. And I just wanted to learn more about these people and who they were and what they were doing. Um, so I, I persevered with the, the meetings and would go back and, uh, and, and, and over, over the weeks, it, it all began to fall into place. I began to see the, the, the mystery of the church come alive through my involvement with the Legion of Mary. That having grown up in Ireland and and a somewhat lukewarm Catholic, this was the first time that I really began to see the church come alive and faith in action, and um, and the, the spirituality of the Legion of Mary began to click with me and Marian devotion and uh, and how grace follows effort, as Frank Duff says, that by putting in the effort, um, you know, we we receive a lot of grace then to, to go out and do the work, um, and. Um, and, and, and that was kind of the, the turning point for me. And, and really, it was true then the Legion of Mary and my formation with the Legion that I, I ended up going on to join the Dominicans. Mm -hmm. And if I can just go back then, back to the history of the Legion, by the way, I, I mentioned that when it was founded in 1921, uh, that the first group were, were, were all women. Uh, but shortly after that, um, Frank Duff, he wanted to do something more practical for the, the homeless and for the poverty in Dublin. Um, so he founded uh, what's now the Morning Star Hospital. Um, so this was founded in 1927. And by this stage, Frank Duff was uh, quite, he was a high ranking civil servant and he, he had a lot of good friends and he, he had a lot of good contacts in the government. And uh, he, um, he approached the government and said that he, he wanted, he had a new uh, organization, the Legion of Mary, and uh, he wanted to do something to tackle the problem of homelessness in the, in, in the city. And they they said to him, great, we'll give you a building and whatever you can do, you're welcome to do it. Uh, interestingly, the building that he was given was the old Black and Tan barracks. So after the Black and Tans had left Dublin, this building had been left idle and, uh, and it was given to Frank Duff to do whatever he could for the homeless situation in, in, in Dublin. And he founded the, the Morning Star Hostel in 1927, uh, which is a hostel for homeless men. Oh. And that hostel then, when that hostel opened, he realized that he needed to form a presidium, a group of the Legion of Mary, uh, with men to work in the hostel. So that was the first men's presidium. And uh, to this day, the Morning Star Hostel is still open. Uh, it's been open 24 seven since 1927, uh, run completely by volunteers, members of the Legion of Mary, no paid staff, and um, and still all men. Still all men. Uh, in 1931, he opened the the hostel a hostel next door for 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 women and children, the Regina Chaley, 
and um, and and the uh, the women in the Legion of Mary work in the in the women's hostel, and the men work in the men's hostel. So those two yeah. hostels are still going today, and um, and and miracles upon miracles of people who have gone through the gates of those hostels and and uh, have turned their lives around through the power of faith. You know. Wow, that's yeah. See, that's that's beautiful, and it's kind of you know you've mentioned grace there, and I think grace is something that it's a short little word, and it's something that we kind of overlook um, so often, and. You know, you've mentioned social justice and, and things like that there earlier. And um, I think it's it's the importance of um, sometimes we can be very eager to get into social justice without prayer and, and things like that are because we don't see the results of prayer. But we see the results of social justice. I know we've spoken about that before, but I think um, not understanding grace, I think, is a big problem that, you know, that you know, that we can do nothing without without God. We can't do anything without grace. Grace is that 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 beautiful gift, that beautiful power too. That that's yeah. It, it can flow through. It can flow to us, and we can do great things through it. Or we can, you know, we can resist. But I think that you know that's that's something that it's it's grace moves us to prayer. But that's the one I think that's a great example of of yeah. how we. Was this grace? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jesus sums up the um, the commandments with love of God and love of neighbor, and uh, and he puts them in that order. I think when you get love of God right, love of neighbor flows on from that, mm. and um, and I think that's where the social justice movement gets it wrong. You know, and and while I mean, there's a lot of good things you can do on on a on a human level to care for brothers and sisters in need. Um, I think if you try and exclude God, you, you know, you, you're kind of missing the point. Whereas if you, if you do it out of love of God, uh, all the other practical things flow from that. Mm. So, uh, so love of God is not exclusive of love of neighbor. They, they go hand in hand, faith and charity. Um, and then of course, you know, going with the Legion, praying the rosary, which is not, um, again, it's, it's not a, a Mary prayer. Like, you know, the, the hail Mary is, centered around jesus the rosary is centered around meditating on jesus through the eyes of mary um so you know it's not you know i've i'm sure you've heard it many times you know people kind of questioning the rosary kind of as if it's why are we worshiping mary or why are we but it's not it's it's going she'll draw us to jesus everything points to jesus and uh and again the the graces will flow from there so i think that's that's beautiful about the Legion. And and so that was, you know, they don't get involved in, in politics. Like you said, that must have been, um, maybe it was an easy decision to make back in 1921 when um, politics was something that was best <laughs> avoided. Brother was fighting brother and things back then. Well, probably, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, and I think over the years, the Legion would have been criticized a lot by that. You know, people join and say, you know, this is the latest uh, battle for the church. We need to be out there campaigning for such an issue. And um, and I, I think Frank Duff was very wise in just saying like, all these things are important. And, and there are many cultural battles that, that the church has to take on and, and, and fight. Uh, so he's not saying just bury your head in the sand and don't engage with the with the problems of the day. But yet you, you have to go deeper than that, you know, and uh, and all these, you know, there's, there's various challenges that come the way of the church and cultural things that, that come and go. Um, but I think the Legion just remains consistent at the core of, uh, of devotion to Our Lady. And, mm. and again, when you get that right, you, everything else will fall into place around that. So, so for example, you know, you could take the, the pro-life issue, which again is one of the big battles for the church nowadays and something very important. Um, but rather than going out campaigning for a pro-life politician who could end up changing their views or whatever, I mean, politics is politics, you know, um, uh, but even if they don't, rather than going out um, campaign, and I'm not saying don't go out and campaign, for, you can certainly do that, but as legion work, uh, we go out there promoting devotion to Our Lady. And, the, and if you can pe bring people back to Our Lady, you, you'll bring them back to a pro-life, you know, outlook. Um, so, you know, and, and you could apply that to any of the, the cultural issues that, that challenged the church. Uh, if you bring back people to Our Lady and Jesus, uh, everything else will flow from that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you go out directly with one issue, you know, be it pro-life or same-sex marriage or any of these things, um, 
you, you, you could end up locking the door to somebody's faith because of that one issue. But if you bring them back, back to the, the core message, you know, of, of Jesus and our, uh, and our lady, um, you're, you're setting them on the foundation then to where everything else, please God, with time, they'll begin to see the bigger picture. And, and I think, I think that's true because I think sometimes when, when it comes to those things, we can focus very much on what's wrong, you know, like, um, we can say about someone's views, oh, no, they're wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You know, if we focus very much on the political issues and it can, we can get very caught up about what's wrong. But I think um, that's a very negative view. It doesn't, it's not appealing to anyone. Whereas I think true faith, knowing that all God wants for us is our happiness. He wants us to thrive. Um, and so he sat down, he basically listed out all the things that will hurt us and where we won't thrive. And so he just gave us a little, the guidelines of this is how you will thrive. This is where you'll find happiness. And I suppose like that, when we go out and we get caught up in the political issues, we're kind of talking about the don'ts, the don'ts, the don'ts. Whereas if we, when we go like this to Our Lady, to, you know, to, to Jesus through Our Lady, it's, we will thrive yeah. and you know and it, it sets us free to live and and that yeah that that moves us away from just the rules yes we will have we will be on the right track and not doing what's wrong anyway yeah i think so yeah yeah you, you reminded me there of a great expression by fulton j sheen where he talked about uh, that it's impossible to break the ten commandments you can only break yourself against them <laughs> that's that's wonderful yeah 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 because yeah, i mean the i know this is a little bit of a sidestep from what you're talking about there but uh but yeah i mean the ten commandments you know divine law and and, and the natural law you know our, our human flourishing they go hand in hand you know that uh that uh, the, the commandments that god gives us they're for our human flourishing you know and uh and because they're divine laws they're eternal uh you know we, we can't break them but you'll only break yourself against them if you try and go against them you know so uh yeah, you know, yeah. So they're that's, that's brilliant and now the legion right so it started then and it was dublin based how quickly did it grow actually it was pretty slow really um i think it was seven years before they set up a second presidium a second group um, so it was really, um, it really evolved over time. Um, uh, and, and then it just kind of snowballed. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it, it took, I think, seven years before the second presidium started up and then gradually began to spread across Dublin and, and then around Ireland. Uh, it was really kind of the late 1930s, 1940s that it began to spread abroad. Um, then we had what they called the, the Legion envoys, who were people who would volunteer to go out to different places around the world and set up the Legion of Mary. Um, so it, it, it went from Ireland to Scotland, down to England. Uh, then, interestingly enough, it went to India. There was a, an English lady who, who uh, went to India and uh, she, she set up the Legion there. So there was a big jump from, from Ireland and the UK over to India. Um, but then, as I said, around the late 30s into the 1940s, um, there were people mostly from Ireland, uh, but a few from around the world. But, but people would come to Frank Duff, the, the founder, and uh, tell him that, uh, that they wanted to, to go abroad and, and set up this wonderful movement in, in other places. Um, so from the 1930s up until, I think, about the, the 60s, the 70s, you had these Legion envoys who would go out to new countries where the Legion had never been before. And, and these were just ordinary lay people who would go out and, and uh, I think they had to commit to a minimum of three years. And, uh, and most would spend maybe a bit longer than that. And they would travel around, um, around, around these countries and meet b bishops and priests and, uh, and just set up new Presidia and, and, and just let it grow. Um, perhaps the best known of these envoys are, you know, Edel Quinn and Alfie Lam. Uh, mm -hmm. Both their causes for beatification have been introduced. Um, Edel Quinn was originally from Canturk in County Cork, although her father was a bank manager. So she moved around different places of Ireland um, as, a, as a young girl. Um, but she joined the Legion of Mary and had a great love for the Legion and volunteered to go to Africa. Um, now, the extraordinary thing about Edel Quinn was she had all kinds of health problems. She had very, very poor health. And, and, um, and yet Frank Duff could see that there was a, 
she was a deeply spiritual girl. There was something very profound about the depth of her, of her spirituality and, and, and the warmth of her character and everything. And, uh, and Frank Duff, in a, in a very controversial decision, he got criticised a lot for this, decided that he would send this poor, young, Irish, sick, weak, feeble girl out to East Africa. And she travelled around, I think, seven countries around Africa and did extraordinary work, um, miraculous work in setting up the Legion of Mary around, around East, East Africa. And uh, she died in, in Kenya. Uh, and she was 37 years of age when she died, so very young. Um, uh, her cause for beatification has been introduced. She's now declared venerable. Um, another example would be Alfie Lam. Um, Alfie Lam was born in Tullamore, County Offaly and uh, had this huge desire. He wanted to be a Christian brother and uh, entered the, the novitiate in Marino. But uh, his health was so poor that he couldn't, he couldn't survive the Christian brothers. He was having faint and attacks and all kinds of health issues um, and uh, couldn't persevere as a Christian brother. Was sent back home to Tullamore and uh, his brother invited him to a Legion of Mary Presidium meeting. And Alfie Lamb just fell in love with the spirituality of the Legion and the work of the Legion and again volunteered to go out as a Legion envoy and um, went up to Dublin, met Frank Duff. And uh, again, Frank Duff was very impressed by this young man. And Frank Duff was only, I think, 19, 20 at this stage. And, um, and despite his poor health, as I said, too sick to be even to survive the novitiate with the Christian brothers. And Frank Duff sent him out to South America. And, uh, and Alfie traveled all over South, South America and set up the Legion of Mary in, in I think, I can't remember how many countries, eight, nine countries, and um, had a desire to go into Russia. He was learning Russia that when he finished his mission in South America, he was going to go into communist Russia and set up the Legion of Mary there, uh, but took, got very sick in Argentina and at 27 years of age, died of cancer. Um, in fact, when, when he died, they, they, they found that he had cancer in almost every body of his, of his body. He died an extraordinarily painful death, but offered up all his suffering for the work of the Legion of Mary in South America and um, was buried in Argentina. And coincidentally enough, he ended up buried with the Irish Christian brothers in, in Buenos Aires. <laughs> so, uh, extraordinary how God works. So Alfie Lamb's cause for beatification has been introduced as well. So, um, so again, th th these are Irish people and, and not that remote from from you know our, our own time more, more important than um, them being irish they're from cork and offaly so, yeah that's right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah oh so, yeah. uh, well, no, that's that's incredible so so you know if someone were um you know if, if they're listening about the legion of America, as as we can see it's it's incredible it, it's it's forming saints um you know it's it's uh, as well as bringing faith and comfort to others it's it's you know it's it's um that's incredible and so the the legion are kind of they're everywhere now i think was this i saw 600,000 was that members or is it 600,000 places there i can't remember i saw something about 600,000 well, it's, it's believed as three and a half million active members around so the world. Six hundred thousand places, then, or whatever. Kind of places or something like that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's every country or almost every country, anyway, that that, that they're present now. Wow. And, uh, yeah, three and a half um, active members, three and a half million active members um, yeah. around the world. And what's um what's the age profile like and the reason i ask is that i think a part of our culture uh well first of all as as a young person it's probably countercultural to you know to be practicing the faith because we're probably told the happiness is everywhere outside of it um but but that aside um uh, it's because again, like the the instant results kind of thing and and all that, I think what's kind of happened to us in the Netflix culture and and all of that is that um, we're I don't know exactly what it what the cause is, but commitment seems to be a big problem for people to um, to many things. I've I've seen it when you know um, with different things volunteering or different things, very hard to get volunteers with for for things. Uh, Maybe it's easier for a one-off thing, but not 
not an ongoing thing or um, people don't like to sign up for something weekly or maybe monthly or, you know, something like that. So um, what's, uh, what's the age profile like of Legion members? Well, it, it makes, I mean, uh, it varies in different places. I mean, I suppose there is a perception that, that it tends to be older people. And, uh, and maybe that's true, um, but I do think there's a lot of young, vibrant groups as well around, around the world. I think different places are different dynamics. Uh, maybe here in Ireland, things went a little bit off, off you know, um, maybe the Legion was seen as a little bit stale for a while, but I think there's a lot of younger people coming back now. Even since I joined 20 years ago, it's, it's amazing the amount of people that have, that have come in that have, were my age or younger, you know, and... Uh, and and in Dublin, we we really made an effort to make it more appealing to younger Catholics and put on youth events, you know, and conferences that were specifically aimed for younger people. Um, and and I I think the Legion in, in other places around the world have done that too. I mean, the likes of the Philippines or you know different parts of Africa, it's it's just teeming with with younger people. Um, but but I do accept that there probably is a perception that that it, it tends to be older people, but. Uh, um, but I don't think that's always the case. And no, I'm just I'm just thinking that like maybe if someone if a younger person is listening and they're maybe sound like they might they might listen to it and think it sounds very attractive. They might be slightly drawn to it and might be put off by the older yeah. kind of age profile in some places. But I suppose when I think of that, then as well, um, you know, if you join as a young person, well, suddenly the age profile. Is coming down a little anyway and that may attract other people to join so you know the young people so yeah. it, sometimes yeah. it takes the first person to take that step yeah yeah i mean I, I remember the first time i went along to a meeting you know I, I was expecting people my own age and i got a little bit of a shock when i turned up and and uh, most of them were you know older shall we say um yeah. uh now i was what 21 22 at the time and uh, i think the next in age was a man in his mid thirties who was still one of my best friends today, you know? Um, but, uh, but at that stage, it seemed a lot older, you know? Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it, I, I think that if, if younger people can join, it will attract other people. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it does spread. Um, but yet when I look back now, I was kind of glad that I joined with people who were older because I learned so much from them. And the wisdom that they had, and uh, the knowledge of the faith, and, and and these are just simple, ordinary people. But uh, but through their years of being involved with the Legion, they had just grown in their knowledge of the faith, and and had such a rich understanding, and um, and just the the depth of their faith was, was just really profound, and it left a huge mark on me, and and that's what really attracted me to the to the Legion when I first joined. Um, so on the surface, yeah, maybe I felt a bit disappointed that I was you know half the age of most of the people in the group um but yet there was also something there that uh, you know that, that there was something about the people that that had been there and had this wisdom and and uh, so much knowledge and 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 you know so much um so much to give um, that, so that I, I, I would just say that someone if they, if they do join the legion and they find that they're the youngest person there or the only younger person uh just give it a go and don't be put off by that yeah, I was, I was going to say that happened to me actually with the um, the men's book club that that started. I was kind of going thinking there'd be fellas my own age and stuff like that. And um, there were some there were a lot of older men there. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, you know, the young one. I thought I might, you know, meet more more people my own age. But I'm kind of thankful initially now that there weren't because um, a lot of not a, uh, some younger men have joined since and and uh and that's great now but um i think if there were a lot of younger people there initially um i don't know i i may not have kind of been humble enough to listen as much i might want to talk more i might want to whereas i was able to actually just sit and learn and and take things in from other men and just see that wow these men who've been doing things for years can teach me so much you know and i think like that yeah that's that's beautiful with the with the legion yeah 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 if you're, if you're kind of hanging around with your, your own peers you're just kind of having the crack or whatever you know yeah. when you're there with people that you, you may not not have anything else in common with but the faith you know um 
you, you kind of realize that we're all children in God's eyes and age doesn't really matter. And, uh, and that even though you might be 50 years younger than someone else um, and totally different background or situation or whatever, uh, but when you're there with United in Faith, um, you're, you're all brothers and sisters in Christ and you can really, really, um, you, you have a much richer friendship with them, you know? Mm even though they might be old enough to be your grandfather, um, you know, you, you, you can have a, a friendship with them in, in the Lord that, that's, um, you know, very profound. Beautiful. And, and Frank Duff then, so he was, was it, was he 32 or something when he founded the Legion? Yeah. How good are you at maths? He was born in 1889 and founded the Legion in 1921. 32. So, yeah. So it was, um, the maths were already interestingly he was born on the 7th of june 1889 founded the legion on the 7th of september 1921 and died on the 7th of november in 1980 so oh a lot of wow. sense there yeah yeah so so 32 and three months when he started well every time i i read about these people are here about these people i realize how much time i've wasted in my life you know thinking about fantasy football points and different things like that you know but no that's that's incredible so so when he went on he he was involved in some way in vatican too wasn't he yeah he was invited over as a as a, an observer he was the only layman to be present at one of the councils and uh, and at the end of it he, he got a standing ovation from from the bishops you know so uh how did he get like how was he chosen as the only you know limit like what was was it the at this point the legion was well yeah at this up? stage the legion was all over the world really and it was flourishing yeah so um so yeah he would have been um he, he would have been recognized now by by the time of the second vatican council and i mean it was interesting because you know the, the vatican council affirmed a lot of what frank duff was was saying i mean frank duff we take a lot of this stuff for granted now when we talk about evangelization and you know the new evangelization and you know pope john paul ii really brought this home and and benedict and pope francis uh you know but uh but for in the 1920s you know and in, in the in, in within the irish church the idea of lay people going out talking about their faith i mean that was seen as hold on a second now you know that's that's not your job you know uh i mean frank duff began praying the, the breviary as a layman and again that was seen as you know who does this guy think he is he's you know is he some kind of quasi cleric or, or what you know people were uh so he, he, you know he was criticized a lot for um for his vision for the, for the lay people to be active in the in the in the faith you know and, and to, to to be out there evangelizing and and uh, and to be praying the divine office you know to enter into the, the prayer of the church and to, to to be going deeper you know um whereas at the time it was seen that you know the priest and religious you know do all the holy things and lay people just turn up for mass and you know pray pay and obey that was you know the old term you, you pray you pay and you you obey you do what you're told um but frank duff said no you know that by by virtue of our baptism uh, the the laity are called to share in the in the mission of the church mm. you know, called called to go out and evangelize uh, that is not just something reserved for those in in the priesthood or religious vows, but every Catholic has not just a right, but an obligation, a duty to go out and and to to share the gift of faith. Um, so a lot of people got it, and a lot of priests were you know fully on board and thought this is wonderful, and they could see the effects in the in the parish of of ordinary lay people going out and and communicating with other people in the parish. Um, but a lot of people didn't get it, and and he was criticised a lot, and and uh, and um, you know a, a lot of even within the church, a lot of people went against him for for this radical view he had of the role of the laity. And when Vatican Council came around, it, it affirmed a lot of what Frank Duff had been had been doing for the previous 30, 40 years. You know, yeah, and you know that's there's something there's something very deep there in that back in those times we're talking about the pews being packed it's very easy when the pews are you know fairly empty and you know it, it's very easy to say okay something needs to be done the, the culture needs to be evangelized or whatever but when when the laws of the country are kind of legally things are in line with catholic teaching the pews are packed 
it's very easy to come along and say, oh, no, Ireland's in a great place. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, sure, everyone's going to mass. Everyone's doing their thing. Everyone has a sacred heart picture in their house, you know, and a picture of the Pope or whatever it is. And, you know, it's very easy to say, no, Ireland's in a great place. And, you know, obviously, you know, we see now from, you know, we see things like, you know, from the, the tragic kind of situations in the mother and baby homes and, and, you know, a lot of those things, you know, we start looking back and we, we can see, you know, some of the, the negative things in, in the culture, but it was, it, it's incredible to be able to look at packed pews and say, something's not right here. Something needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Frank Duff could see that. And it's, it's extraordinary when you go back and you read his essays and, and this is what we're doing on the, on the Friday nights where we go back and look at his writings. And, and it is quite remarkable when you go back and you look at uh, how prophetic he was and how he could see that although the churches were, were, were packed, he could see the cracks. And, um, and I don't think Frank Duff would be at all surprised if he, if he saw the condition of the church in Ireland t- today and how so many churches have, you know, regardless of the, the the pandemic but how many churches are how many pews are are, are empty um he, he could see it happening and uh and particularly when you read his, his later writings you know from the the 1960s 1970s um you know the warnings that were there i spoke earlier about how on one of our sunday night discussions we looked at uh, john paul ii's visit to ireland and how he could see uh, the shift in irish society and the culture and and uh um, and the warnings that he was given to Ireland, but uh, but it was there in Frank Duff as well, and and he was calling it out. He could see that although the churches might be packed, the um, the you know he 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 could question how deep were the roots of the faith of the people, how much of it was people just going along, uh, how much were they just being carried by the culture, you know, um, yeah. and. Um, and yeah, as I said, he, he could see he could see things were he, he could see that the things weren't things weren't as, as stable as as they might have looked on the surface. That's amazing. So no, so I suppose to kind of to look back again now with everything that's going on um, with kind of what you're involved in uh, the vocations Irish Dominican Vocations dot com is a site where you'll get a lot of information on what's going on there anyway. But again, for any men ent- interested in um, vocations, your contact details are on that site. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then from there, the most, let me see, the, the St. Joseph consecration is starting on the 15th of February. If people want to join in with you on Zoom through that, again, send an email up uh father Cullum's email will be at the bottom of of this um podcast wherever you're getting it from and you so that's a, that's a 33 day and that is finishing on the 19th of march feast of saint joseph feast saint joseph no better day to finish it and then we've got uh you've your monthly book club yeah so if people want to contact you about that bang you off an email um okay the legion of mary people can just because it's in so many places people just google their local location and legion of mary and yeah. they'll find information that way yeah and, and if, if anyone's listening from dublin and would like to get involved by all means give me or anywhere in ireland give me a call and uh, i can get them in contact with the local group but particularly for those who are in dublin and uh, i mentioned the morning star hostel that that continues to run today uh, for for homeless men and um I'm, I'm still involved with that as a spiritual director. So, so if anyone would like to get involved with the work for the homeless, uh, you're very welcome to contact me and, uh, or even the women who might like to work in the Regina Chaley Hostel for, for homeless women. Um, I, can, I can put you in contact as well with them. Great. And uh, then you've got your Friday. So there's two sessions in case anyone's getting confused. There's your Friday uh, session, your Fridays with Frank, that's centered on Frank Duff reading his essays. How many essays are there in total? I know it's one per week, but how many essays has he kind of published? Oh, I'd say um, I'd say at least 100 anyway. So that's not going to finish any week soon. No, <laughs> it keeps going through the lockdown anyway, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I mean, some of them have been published in, in book form, you know, so there's a couple of books that have been released over the years with a collection of his essays. 
and right. uh, there's 43 in this one. So uh, I, I say it's well over 100 actually when I think of it, um, maybe, yeah. yeah. But there's okay. plenty, anyway, there's plenty of reading material there. And uh, just, uh, on his letters too, by the way, just to make this point, when he, he when he was uh, throughout his, his life and he was setting up the Legion of Mary and with all the envoys who were going around the world and people who were contacting him about setting up the Legion in various different places and correspondence with bishops and priests and cardinals, everything, uh, he kept a record of every letter he wrote. Um, and on file, there are 33,000 letters by Frank wow. Burke. So, um, wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Which is, um, it's one of the reasons why his uh, cause for beatification is is taken so long. It was because he left so much work behind and and so many so much writing that um that obviously all that has been looked through to make sure there's no theological errors or whatever. Um, so all of that has been processed at the moment, and people are reading through his work just to make sure everything's uh everything is okay and doctrinally sound uh before they can take to the next uh, stage of his canonization uh but there's so much stuff there and and uh and and so much wisdom even when you read his letters you know um some of them are just practical things about how the le legion is governed and setting it up and so forth but a lot of it is people who are, who are writing to him with problems and personal issues and things like that and uh and he just he just um he would stay up all night dictating letters into in, into a recorder and then they would be typed up and and he had a great memory for people and their situations and and he you know he'd all this correspondence going out all over the world that uh, that he would all these friendships and connections with people and he would just uh, he would, he'd be able to just read a letter from them pick up where, where he was and keep a, a conversation going so he'd, he'd all these conversations that would be going on for years with different people around the world and and uh, and dealing with so many problems and issues and and challenges for the legion and uh, as well as people's own personal difficulties that they'd be coming to him for advice and everything so yeah an extraordinary man so maybe when we finish his published articles we could even go through some of his letters but th there's no shortage of stuff i think we'll be doing our fr fridays with frank for for quite some time wow that that's that's amazing like he just sounds like a man just, I don't know, full of love. You know, it's yeah. just, uh, yeah, it's amazing. And then uh, finally, you've got your, um, on the Sunday nights. Now, the Friday sessions are there at 9 p.m. 9 p.m., um, yeah. yeah. And again, you don't have to be involved with the Legion or familiar with Frank Duff or anything, even if you just want to come along and, and, and listen. And we do send out the emails that people do want to read them in advance, but, but just to come along and, and to hear the discussion. And that's that's nine p.m. on Fridays, and on um, Sundays at nine p.m. you have Rosary and Ramblings. Sunday Rosary and Ramblings, nine o'clock on a Sunday. Yeah. So and, great uh, and I'll give a little presentation on some aspect of the faith. Again, we vary it around from week to week, so we don't get bogged down on one particular issue. And uh, and then it's it's just open to discussion on Zoom, and people are free to make comments or ask questions or just have a, a chat on a Sunday night with like-minded Catholics. That's fantastic. So there's a lot going on. And, you know, I think it's one of the beauties of the lockdown. We can get very kind of caught up in the negative side of, you know, being cut off from people or whatever. But um, I'm often, my mind does go back to Walter Chiswick and that book, He Leadeth Me. And, and I do think about, you know, okay, we're in the situation we're in. It's not ideal, but what can I do? What can I do to grow in holiness? What can I do to change little things here and there? What what can I work on? What virtue do you know can I work on? Where are my vices? And um yeah, certainly I think um, you know, things like this, you know, even even maybe during Lent, you know, these Friday sessions or Sunday session or something like that, that you know, they're they're a great way to just listen converse with like-minded people listen and and just grow in faith and uh yeah certainly um can't do anyone any harm yeah and i, I think it's, it is very important especially when the churches are closed that we keep a sense of community amongst catholics and uh and uh we keep each other encouraged and and uh and keep ourselves you know keep we, we keep forming ourselves and keep our prayers strong and and uh and that we stay connected yeah, I think that's it, because I think it's, you know, instead of it being a, a lost time, it can just be a different time, really. You know, it's, yeah, uh, yeah so, so, Father Cullum, thanks so much for joining us. And, uh, yeah, we'll um, look forward to having you back again soon. Great, 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 great to catch up with you, Kevin. Yeah, and keep up the good work. Thanks very much. God bless. God bless.